you know, going on our holidays. We like to change fundamentally what it is that we do. So everyone, businesses like this, politicians like we all like this. So it means we can really pass the problem on to technology in the future and our children. But the CO2 from keeping these lights on in here, we keep this projector running, will be in the atmosphere for 100, 200 years. Probably 20% of it will be there for up to 10,000 years. So we are changing the climate now for the next hundreds, possibly thousands of years by holding this event. So that it tells us that the build-up of CO2 that matters, not some spurious target for 2050. But that shift from a long-term target, which is meaningless, to actually towards cumulative emissions, i.e. the build-up of CO2 day in, day out. When these lights are on tomorrow, if they're on tomorrow, they will add to the CO2 from today. And that build-up means you have a, you, you're, you're concerned with the cumulative budget, the area under the curve. And that changes the whole chronology, changes the timeline of climate change. From one where we focus on long-term reductions, wind turbines in 2030, or nuclear power, or whatever, carbon capture storage, whatever it might be, biofuel. It takes us from that to saying, actually, when we go home tonight, we've got to not get the tube, we've got to walk, turn the fridge off when we get there, you know, and live a completely, almost in our country, a zero carbon life, and we should have started doing it quite a lot of years ago. So it changes the whole chronology from about the future to about now. And that, that of course, is unpopular with all of us. You know, we don't like that, and hence, by and large, the whole population is, is sort of, and taken up with this cognitive dissonance, this way of deliberately scamming the whole system, um, or, or the science, if you like, of climate change. Now, in addition to these, this, these set of changes, there are some other ways that we are tweaking, the, tweaking the, uh, the data, if you like, to give us answers we would like. And I think these are ones that we need to start to, to push harder on. Firstly, almost all the emission scenarios that are out there from the Committee on Climate Change, or from the people that advise the Committee on Climate Change, um, but also right around the globe, they always underplay short-term emission growth. We know what the emission growth will be in the next few years. It will be 2, 3, 4, possibly as high as 5%, but probably somewhere between 2 and 4%. Yet they almost never embed that emission growth, even in the short term. So that already means that they're playing with just the next few years. They all, all, almost without exception, will assume that emissions will peak very early, by 2016. Is the, it's the Stern report, have any of you heard of the Stern report? Yeah. The Stern report, do you know when the emissions were assumed to peak in that globally? 2015, globally. Did anyone think that in 2006, when Stern was writing this, he thought emissions were going to peak in 2015? Well, in nine years? Find out. Hmm? We seriously couldn't find out. Yeah. So we can't, we, can't, we can't think that those sort of assumptions, that that is viable, and then to do the economic analysis on the back of that, I think is actually quite dangerous, even though I like his economic analysis. But it's worth bearing in mind at the moment, the UK policies, from which were advised in the Committee on Climate Change, are premised on an assumption that the, that the global emissions will peak in 2016. Does anyone here think that is reasonable, that global emissions will peak in the next four years, three years? I do. You think they'll peak? Well, good, that's one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well, I hope the rest of us are wrong. That's all I can say. I hope the rest of us are wrong on this. Um, they also assume that in that, you have to assume that the emissions from China and India will broadly peak in 2017. Does anyone think that's viable? Remember that China is about one third of the global emissions of CO2 at the moment. I'm not blaming the Chinese. They made my Mac laptop and they probably made the, half the well, they didn't make these clothes of the European, but anyway, they made a lot of the things that we use all the time. I'm not blaming the Chinese, but they're a third of emissions of CO2 at the moment, and they're looking to increase their emissions significantly over the next 5, 10, 20 years. So that's the well, our policy debate. I think they'll peak then. Hmm? I think that's as well. You think what they'll peak? In, in 2018. Well, again, I hope you're right on that one. Um, <laughs> The, re the reduction rate, in other words, the, 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 the coming off the curve, how fast we can possibly achieve, is being dictated in all the analysis out there by a group that I call astrologists, that other people call economists. They're <laughs> 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 so much cheaper to employ astrologists than you think And I'm, I'm being a bit unfair there, because it's only a particular group of economists, and I think that they're applying their, their approach to, to, a, to a problem that's not suitable for them. I might come back to that later. Uh, we're talking about very large changes, and they're applying it, economic theories that are based on very small changes. So we've been told by economists that if you want economic growth, you can only come down at about uh, 2 to 4% per annum reduction rate. And that dictates all of the science, absolutely all of the science on this. And the assumptions in all the scenarios out there is that geoengineering, in other words, ability to suck the CO2 out of the air, is, it, it just exists, that we can actually do that. We've not done it so far significantly. The assumption is that it will always be there in all of the scenarios. So that's, that's a completely un unreasonable set of criteria on which to base your analysis. Not saying you shouldn't do one or two analyses like that, but there should be other ones that say actually China may not peak in 2017. And there should be other things out there that, that counter that. Consequently, consequently, we have very different views on, on, on two degrees C. 
This is Peckley Government, the Committee on Climate Change Approach, and this is our paper that um, Alice Bowes and myself had published in the Royal Society a few years ago. Um, and increasingly, people are sort of saying this is not too, un you know, they accept this as a sort of a, as a factual account of where the numbers are taking us. The chance of exceeding 2 degrees C, the government's got a 63% chance of exceeding 2 degrees C. I don't think that's reasonable. I don't think it's reasonable to expect the poor people in the world living in the low, lower, lower parts, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere, to have to put up with the sea level rise and the devastation that that will cause to them. There are 30 million people living the, within one metre sea level rise of the uh, coastal strip of Bangladesh. 30 million people, half the population of the UK. And of course that area is also vulnerable to storms and so forth. We said that we thought it should be at, least, that, 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 at worst a 37% chance of exceeding 2 degrees C. We don't think you can get any better than that now. We've left it too late. But in 2013, we've pumped out 400 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide since 2000. What are we doing? Uh, we said global emissions could peak in 2020. In fact, our new analysis, which we've not quite completed, says 2025 now. So we think that's too early. Um, the Committee on Climate Change in 2016. We say poorer nations should be allowed a longer period to reach their peak in emissions. That seems fair to us. The Committee on Climate Change have a very early date for that. We think deforestation is not the responsibility of the only the countries that deforest. When I came down yesterday by train, there were virtually no forests in the UK, because we have deforested. We have to have the benefit of lots of land and using the forests. I don't think it's fair to say the countries that are deforesting, all those emissions should relate to them. And somewhere between probably 12 and 20% of global CO2 comes from deforestation. If you look at the mitigation rate, well, you can't see it from the back. But the difference in terms of the rate of reduction of emissions is that if you use the government's analysis, it's got to be 3% per annum. It ticks the box for economists. If you use our analysis, it's 10% per annum. 10% emission reduction every single year to give you an outside chance of 2 degrees C. So that is not looking particularly hopeful. So where does that leave us? I think a lot of people would suggest that 2 degrees C looks too difficult. And we hear this all the time. Well, we can't do 2 degrees C. And that's actually a very, co a very common debate now amongst a lot of scientists and policymakers. 2 degrees C is too challenging. We can't do it. And you can see why they're saying it. So what about a 4 degrees C future? That sounds more viable. Firstly, you have a larger carbon budget, and therefore if you have a larger carbon budget, you haven't got to mitigate emissions quite as fast, so we've got a bit more time to get these technologies in place. But 4 degrees C means mean global surface temperature. You have to think that most of the planet is made up of, of oceans, of, of water, and water has a very high thermal mass. So but if you're going to have a 4 degrees C global average, that means your land temperature probably is an average of somewhere 5 or 6 degrees C. So you're seeing a higher temperature on land. If you follow some of the work, that, um, and this should come with a caveat, there's a lot of uncertainty around this, as there is with all this sort of area of climate science. But this is from the, uh, from the, uh, the Met Office, the Hadley Centre based in the Met Office, the, 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 the modelling for the UK and for the UK government on climate change. And they're trying to say, well, there's some sort of handle on how this might play out. What would that mean for the hottest days of the year? So think of the 2003 heat wave when 20 to 30,000 people died um, across, across Europe. Um, a lot of people, other people die in other parts of the world, but we don't really care too much about that, given. Um, this would mean that during the heat wave like that, in China, you would see a 6 to 8 degree C temperature rise. So imagine they had two months of really hot weather, and, they, and most of their buildings now, if they're putting up, have no thermal mass in them. Um, so that means that they're very hard to keep cool, you have to put air conditioning units on them. It's also worth bearing in mind that as the temperature goes up, you, you evaporate the soil, the moisture out of some of the soil. Most of the cables in cities around here are, are, for electricity are underneath the ground. Actually, it's the moisture in the soil that is really important for keeping the cables cool. So as the cables can't cool, they, can transmit less, they can't transmit as much electricity. So at the same time we're putting our air conditioning units on, and our fridges and freezers are working extra hard because it's a heat wave, the cables can't send the power down the lines. So you start to see a whole host of things that start to occur that cause problems. And London's what was it, three days worth of food in London. If your fridges and freezers go down, it's probably about half an hour. So, um, you, know, you start to see other sets of issues that start to come on, on board this. In the UK, in, in, in Central Europe, but think of our system, it's a Victorian system. The sewers were put down, the, a lot of the, the cables have been put down in the last um, you know, many, many decades. The water network often is quite old. A lot of the buildings we stay in, I think the building opposite, you know, a lot of the buildings are old buildings. This infrastructure was not designed for large populations. No, but large populations in, in structures that were designed for a long time ago, not for this new climate. 8 to 10 degrees on the heat wave in 2000, 2003. So the tarmac will start melting. The tubes will be running. Yeah, you won't have to run your fridges and freezers as much as you'd like to, if at all. So there are lots of other issues starting to come on 10 to 12 degrees C in New York. So these are huge changes from a 4 degree C temperature rise. Now, I don't really care too much about Europe and, and New York, because I think we've caused the problem knowingly. 
So I think, well, I know, I'd rather not be in that position, but my main concern is the people who haven't caused the problem, who live in the lower, lower latitudes, and for those people, 4 degrees C rise, if you look at it in terms of their food, now there's, again, there's a lot of uncertainty here, and this is not driven mostly, <coughs> I gather this is driven mostly by the increase in temperature, rather now than by the changes in precipitation, by rainfall. At 2 degrees C, you've got a lot of rainfall movement, and to be blunt about it, the models are very poor at, at um, estimating where the rainfall will go, but they're quite good at estimating temperature issues. So as the temperature goes up and up, actually the crops don't start to grow simply because of the temperature being higher. So 4 degrees C, according to the Hadley Centre, 40% reduction in the staple crops, maize, rice, those sorts of crops. At the same time, the population heads towards 9 billion. So we're going to be struggling over here, and some of the poorer parts of the world will be really struggling with just the basics of food and so forth. So that's a world that I should say we have to avoid at all costs. And I think that's what comes out from, if you talk to a lot of scientists who work in this area, they would suggest that 4 degrees C temperature rise is probably incompatible with an global, organized global community. We're probably going to fight, which we're very good at. I mean, blame everyone. I mean, we blame the Poles at the moment for a slight dip in our economy. We always find someone else. Whatever happens, it's never our fault. It's always someone else's fault. It's be a, certainly a Western trade, if not a human trade. Um, it's beyond adaptation. A lot of people are arguing that as you won't be able to adapt to this. And some people will adapt by dying, if you call that adaptation. And I've heard that from quite a few academics. So we'll muddle through. You know, we'll muddle through. I'll go and visit my uncle on the west coast of Scotland on the Isle of Arran, whilst people in Bangladesh die. You know, that's not muddling through, in my view. Um, it's devastating for ecosystems. Ecosystems do evolve, they can change, but they can't evolve at this sort of rate. So it's probably devastating for ecosystems. And of course, we're in the way of many ecosystems. Ecosystems have traditionally moved when temperature changes, but now you've got cities in the way, and roads in the way, and you know, migrating populations for them. And it's highly unlikely to be stable. As you head towards these sorts of temperatures, all this analysis does not assume any of these things called tipping points, discontinuities, nonlinearities, and so forth. So it's highly unlikely to be stable. So if you see 4 degrees C, it might well keep going up to 5 or 6. You'll start getting other feedbacks. And eventually the planet could actually feed back. And actually what we do is pretty irrelevant. Um, and so I would think it's, I was saying, I think it's, it's fair to say that a 4 degrees C type future, moving in that, that direction, is, is, is simply something we can't contemplate. We have to avoid it at all costs. So that takes us back to 2 degrees C. Or 3, but I mean, we're, we're, on the, we're on the probabilities of exceeding 2 anyway. Um, 2 degree C mitigation, this puts this in some sort of, ha some sort of quantitative sense now. What's that required for those of us in wealthy parts of the world, for the OECD countries, UK and so forth? Um, that's about a 10% per annum reduction year on year, and we should have started some time ago. 10% every single year. If you think that, that's about a 40% reduction in emissions by 2015. If you think about our own emissions, and my guess is that probably quite a few of you here, some of you here will be average, some will be above, and some will be below. A lot of the places I go, there's nowhere below. Yeah, everyone's way above the average. You say to them, do you think you're about to manage a 40% reduction in your emissions by 2015? Do you think you're about to make a 70% reduction in your emissions by 2020? That's the sort of numbers we would have to see from the wealthy parts of the world to give the, give the poor parts of the world a little bit of emission space for an outside chance of 2 degrees C. And basically by 2030, come back to the decarbonisation targets if you want to look at them. Um, I'll be writing something about this this afternoon on the way home, actually. Um, the decarbonisation targets have to be nearly 100% for 2030. That's not just electricity. That's every form of energy. If you want to give a bit of space to the poor parts of the world. And the reason people argue about different targets is that they're not giving the space to the poor parts of the world and they're not saying that. Now that's impossible. That's what everyone tells me. That's impossible. Well, I bet then with 4 degrees C, that's also impossible. So the mitigation is impossible, and if we don't mitigate, the world we live with is also impossible. So in that sense, I'm making this science flippant, it's not meant to be really, that the future is impossible. We can't, we, we can't stop getting there, we can't live there when we do get there. So what can we do about it? We have to think differently. The reason it's impossible is we have a particular mindset, and we've got to get out of that mindset and start to think differently about the challenges that we're facing. And if we keep using the old mindset, it might guide some things we do, but we keep using it to try and resolve these problems. And it simply isn't appropriate anymore, and I'm going to come back to that um, in the next few slides. This is all pretty despairing stuff, and um, I keep getting told that it's all doom and gloom. Well, I'm, not, I'm, I'm just a messenger, so don't really shoot me. Um, <laughs> but I am going to try to make some comments that I've been using with Manchester City Council, with their Economic Scrutiny, Scrutiny Committee a couple of weeks ago, and with other events with them. And I think there are some, some more uh, positive directions that we can move that, move, that mean that 2 degrees C is not yet impossible. Uh, still challenging, I think it's fair to say. So the three things I'm going to touch on here, one is an equity. I think, actually, I think the equity dimension might give us a, a message of hope. It's also a very challenging <coughs> message that comes out of the equity issue. Um, technology, there's a lot that technology can do. As an engineer, I'm really keen on technology. Um, 
And also I'm going to say something about growth, which actually will feed, I think, a bit into your agenda, particularly today. Um, is it a useful proxy, or is it um, a destructive dogma, or an obstructive dogma? Destructive dogma, I think, probably better. Um, so let's look at the equity one first. Who are the emitters? We know who they are. We see them when we shave or when we put our makeup on. Um, and that may not be the case for everyone here, but most of the places I go here, it, it is that same group. There are 7 billion people. Do we need to make policies for 7 billion people, or do we make policies for the people that are actually causing the problem? It would seem wise to me to actually tailor your, your policies to the people who emit. And how many people are, are emitting? This is, this is one of the mis... Well, it's more than misnomer. It's a, it's a deliberate ruse, I think, in, in a lot of climate science. And not climate science, we're discussing about climate change. People say it's a population issue. I think it's a consumption issue. And I'll come back to why that is. Pareto, Wilfredo Pareto, a famous Italian economist, but I came across this as an engineer, the 80-20 rule. Um, broadly, 80% of something relates to 20% of those involved. This is just a ballpark <coughs> sort of, you know, guide. And it works for many aspects of life. It gives you a feel for the things you're looking at. And actually, it holds quite well for emissions. 80% of emissions comes from about 20% of the population there or thereabouts. It holds quite well for, for income and not quite so well for wealth, but it's still not bad for wealth. Now, if you then say in that 20% of the population that are responsible for most of the emissions, who in that particular group is responsible? Can you do the same thing again? In that group, you see the same division again. And actually, from some of the work that we've done and some of the work we're doing and other people are doing, it does seem to be that you keep doing that. And if you do that, at least theoretically um, on, it, on its own, it would suggest you'd have a 50% reduction in emissions. Sorry, 50% of the emissions, rather, come from 1% of the population. Now, that's, yeah, that's great. That works on, on you know, textbooks on a page. In reality, we're talking about 40 to 60% of emissions come from somewhere like 1% to 5% of the world's population. And it probably isn't that different in quite a lot of the Anglo-Saxon countries. If you look at emissions in the UK, I bet they're spread like that. They won't be even. So that's, you know, that, I think that says a lot about who we need to get, you know, reduce their emissions. We need that particular group. But who are they? Climate scientists. I haven't met one that isn't like that yet. I mean, they're usually on planes to some jamboree around the world. So every climate scientist, every journalist, pontificator, skeptic, you know, the Lawson, the Livius, um, you know, the David Shukmans, the Harrivans, I mean, they've always been pointing from somewhere exotic in the world or flying back from another tour. Um, every academic that I've ever come across, because they always have to international conferences, um, but they're really important. You've got, to, you've got to have this cultural exchange. Yet often I think you've got a cultural exchange. In Manchester, Cheetham Hill is an area just a few miles north of the university. Most academics have never been there. There's a cultural exchange, and you can get the tram out there. Um, anyone who gets on the plane once a year, you start to put yourself in that category. And I've made a bit of a guess here, um, and this maybe we'll learn this. If you're heading towards 30k a year in your income, you're probably moving in that category. You're probably in that category or, or moving towards it. So in other words, what I'm saying here, from a global perspective, is many of us, not all of us, but many of us are actually in that 1% to 5%. So we know the people who've got to make reductions, and it isn't some other people somewhere else. And the argument's often been, well, the Chinese are trying to live like us. Take the poor, take the average, not the, not the mean person, the mode person, the typical person in China. Increase their emissions at about 10% per annum, and their emissions aren't high enough to really matter too much till about 2025, 20, 2030. By that time, we have to have low carbon energy supply in place, or it's too late anyway. So the thing that matters in the short to medium term is consumption by a particular group. It's not a population problem. Sustainability may well be a population problem. Climate change is a consumption problem. Mitigation is mostly about the few, not about the many. So um, I'll say something about that. So that, I'm suggesting that gives us some um, handle of hope, because we know who the emitters are. Unfortunately, uh, they're the same people that make the policies. It's a bit cheeky. It's the foxes have to make policies to, you know, to put better wire mesh around the chicken coop. Um, so let's now look at technology and refocus um, here on, on demand. So I'm not looking at the supply technologies. There's lots we can do there, but they're a long way away. And they're really important that we need to get them in place. So I'm not saying we shouldn't do them. We need to do them, and we need to do them much faster than we do them now. But the demand side can be a little much quicker than that. This is an old slide I've used, and since using it, a few things have changed, but not a lot. If you want electricity or light, okay, these are quite efficient, but still a lot of lights around the, book, around the world are incandescent light bulbs, still. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, also, refrigerators. If you have an A-rated refrigerator, it's likely to have more emissions by about 40 to 60% more emissions than an A++ refrigerator. So you think there are huge things that we can do on the, on the demand side to reduce our emissions. If you have a, a, a lighting refrigerator, you require electricity. If you require electricity, you require a transmission and distribution network, pylons and the, the cables under the ground. You also need a power station to be running, and you need the Venezuelans or some other poor people in the world to dig the coal out, well, or, or American coal we're burning a lot on there, 
Um, uh, they're, they're using shale gas and they're sending us their coal. Hence our emissions went up last year. Um, so then you can also be burning coal that's, or gas that's produced from elsewhere in the world. And you start to put the numbers on this. If you want 10 units of useful coldness or light, then your system is probably going to have quite a lot of efficiency, inefficiencies in it, your, your appliance, which you could make much more efficient if you swap from an A-weighted fridge to an A++ fridge. A-weighted fridges are rubbish. They should be not be sold. They have those B and C are much worse. But your transmission distribution network will lose somewhere between 6 to 8%. Most of it actually is in the low voltage stuff underground in your cities. The high voltage pylons are pretty efficient, about 2% loss. Power stations, constrained by the second law of thermodynamics, they're by and large somewhere between 35 and probably 55% efficient. 55% is pretty good. I mean, once you start running, they probably don't run quite at that. Um, and you can't get them much higher than that. And the, the normal sorts of power stations. And then you've got to get the coal out of the ground, put it on a train, to a port, onto a ship, onto another train, onto the power station, and do that every single day for the 40 years of that life, of the life of that power station. So you've got to put that in. And so you start to say, well, actually, if you save something here, look at the saving you get here. And yet all the discussions around power stations. Switch the lights off when you leave a room. Buy a smaller refrigerator, get an A++ one. You know, do something, you know, do things that are different at this end. And you ra very rapidly change this at this end. And I, I haven't put a slide on here, but I have another one on cars. And it's worth bearing in mind that, that about 80 to 90 percent of all the vehicle kilometers traveled by cars are traveled by cars that are under eight years old. So if we said that the standard had to be at the best that's available on the market now, not including the hybrids, just normal internal combustion engine cars, we would see about a 50% reduction in emissions in something like about 10 years. If we just put a standard in for current cars that are available on the forecourt that use diesel as, a, as normal cars do, that's not even hybrid or electrical, it's not public transport, it's not cycling, it's not walking, it's normal cars that do normal things. If we said you had to have the best available, had to become what you all used, then you have about 50% reduction. So we don't need new technology there. And the demand opportunities dwarf the supply side, we need to be put them in place really quickly. Growth. This, these are the final few slides, I'll give you my minutes there. Um, I would argue it's a misguided proxy, and I'll probably touch on some, some um, dodgy terrain here with, with some of you, perhaps. Um, Stern, the Committee on Climate Change, and others make the point that mitigation, reductions in emissions of over 4% per annum, um, are incompatible with economic growth. But at the same time, I think if you look at the economy at the moment, I'm not too interested in what the economists have to tell us. The economy is broadly stalled. Self regulated markets no longer regulate themselves, if they ever have done. We've pumped 350 billion, 350 billion quantitative easing into banks. Where's it gone? Yeah, we, we have the money. We're not short of resources. It's been essentially squandered. We could have done something much more with that if we thought differently about these sets of issues. We are in an unprecedented time economic, economically now. This is a great opportunity to actually think differently about the problems. Not just the climate problems, we've got these other sort of economic issues, which a lot of economists are saying they haven't got a clue about. I think most of them are saying. Um, but either they're, they're saying or they're obviously demonstrating it. They haven't got a clue how to get out of this situation. So we've got this sort of com combination of two sets of events that I think if you pull them together and think more innovatively about it, we may be able to bring them together to give us all a lower carbon and a higher quality lifestyle. So growth is a proxy. No one wants growth. What you want is better health, better life expectancy, improved welfare. You want your employment to be good. You want your income to be reasonable. You want it to be a much more equitable society. You want the literacy rates to be high. You want there to be less crime. They're the things that you want. So why measure it in growth? Yeah, a tanker accident is growth. Yeah, these are the things we're looking for. We know what the things are out there. Growth itself is it, it's a proxy. And I would argue it's a very dangerous proxy. It's, in, in itself, it's, it's, it's meaningless. So if you imagine the UK, we haven't put 350 billion pounds into, into the banker's hands, and maybe a lot of it was only digital money anyway, but even if you put a good chunk of that in, to, into the UK's built environment, so to say we want to make a much more green infrastructure. Joseph Brownstein Foundation estimated that somewhere about 290 billion would be required to retrofit all the houses in the UK to make them low carbon and resilient to a changing climate. And that thing said, where would he get 290 billion? Well, from the banks. <laughs> yeah, that's much less than we put into QE. So the money is there to do the sorts of things, the sorts of changes that we need. And if you think about retrofitting the housing stock, let's forget the environment, let's forget climate change, and it's all the government anyway. Um, this is what matters, isn't it, really? That's not really I don't mean that, it's all the better, but I mean, th th these other things that really matter. If you improve the housing stock, you reduce fuel poverty. That's 20% of the houses in the UK. So somewhere about 5 million homes, if you make them, if you improve the quality of those homes, they would come out of fuel poverty. They would reduce their energy bills and hence their emissions. You increase their resilience to volatile energy prices. 
So these are all good things, regardless of the climate. You provide mass skilled and semi skilled employment. Because a lot of these jobs are, do not require highly skilled people. They can be trained quite quickly to do these sorts of things. And at the same time, you reduce emissions, which I think is quite good, and you make your whole world what's more climate resilient. But these are almost add ons. It just seems, you know, why aren't we doing these sorts of things? You need a transport network. If you do that, if you had a rapid transition to a low carbon transport network, you reduce air pollution. That means you improve the vulnerable conditions of the poor people who live on the roads. You reduce accidents. That would be quite good. I mean, uh, when you train someone up and they get killed in a car crash, 3,000 3, people killed roughly a year. I can't remember the exact numbers. It's between 2,500 and 3,000 people a year killed on the roads, many other people injured. You reduce those accidents. That's good for the economy. Um, you reduce congestion time. So that means you improve uh, productivity. And that encourages in inward investment because your, your cities are now, are now working much more efficiently. So all of this is good stuff. And at the same time, you reduce emissions. So we need to be thinking about how you ally these two sets of agendas together. And I think that they can come together, but I still think we have to move away from economic growth in, as our proxy. We have to look at the things we really want to measure. And um, ultimately, um, in the last two slides now, I think we must escape the shackles of the 20th century um, thinking that we have, 20th century mindset. And um, if we're able to resolve 21st century problems, at the moment we still think as if we're in the last century. That's not good enough. We are in the 21st century. We have to think quite differently. This is the thing about it. we're in the 21st century, and the, the Mercedes B Benz diesel engine, the steam turbine, was designed about 1890, and we're still using those to generate our power. The, the, the jet engine, the little jet engine, was as I said before, 1936. So in the 21st century, we're using devices and designs of energy systems that actually come from well over 100 years ago. Um, and I would argue that this, this sort of shift that we need to make, right, will actually demand a huge amount of leadership. It will um, demand a lot of courage from all of us, from our policymakers, which we should try and support them, and they are courageous. It will demand um, courage from us, from the electorate, from organizations, from companies. And it will require innovative thinking, to think really differently, not to always knock people down for saying things that may be not particularly popular or unusual, things they might be saying. We need to be much more engaged collectively as teams, um, and we have to accept the fact that the world will be awash with difficult choices. And for quite a few of us, professors like me, we will have to take a big hit in terms of the sorts of things that we can do in our lifestyle. As Robert Unger noted some time ago, I think it's a wonderful quote, I use this repeatedly, but I don't pay many royalties. Um, at, at every level, the greatest obstacle to transforming the world is that we lack the clarity and the imagination to conceive that it could be different. And we have to, we have, the future is impossible, as I tried to describe before, unless we start to think differently. When it's forced upon us now, we have to think differently, we have to conceive alternative futures. Um, and I think if we do think about those things in the short to medium term, or almost immediately start to think about them, then there is some real hope for us, at least the, the two, degree, two to three degrees C temperature level, to actually probably build relatively low carbon society that is climate resilient as well. So I think back to my final slide. Um, I've got a website with some, some works on there, so feel free to go there and have a look at that. I've also got one of those modern things, I've got a Twitter account, where I, where I post links to things that I've written and other interesting bits and pieces. Um, that's the end. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Kevin. I think uh, on that last slide there, I, th I think you do have a lot of uh, sympathetic ears in, in the audience on the question of growth. I, I think, but maybe that's something that people can debate and discuss later. We're, we're very stupidly behind time, but it seems wrong not to give the opportunity to have some questions at this stage. So, wow. Wow. Okay. Um, let's take two or three. Let's take two or three. Um, are people happy that we're behind and they don't mind having the agenda pushed back? Yes. yes. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Let's take two or three. There was a mic. Where's the gentleman with the, the mic? Could I have somebody who's... Um, could somebody, one of the stewards, any stewards in the room, could you just grab the <coughs> mic and take it to the people I'm going to point to? Okay, so the mic is here, a steward, <coughs> no steward, right, okay. Can we turn it on anyway? Thank you, thanks John. Um, right, okay, so let's take...